the general public does not know can't, uh, and does not care whether it took you 10 days to make a record, 10 weeks, or 10 years. It's the end result. It's the product that comes out. So they don't care about, well, the budget was only this big. That's why it didn't sound like, you know, they don't, no. It's not going to, no. So whatever you have to do to make sure that it comes out the way you want it to come out, that's what you have to do. My, my goal was to really try to play with as many great musicians as possible. And uh, the first session I ever did uh, <clears throat> was in uh, New York at, 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 at uh, Electric Lady Studios, where I played with uh, the guys on the session, uh, Nathan Watts on bass, who plays with Stevie Wonder, who's been Stevie Wonder's musical director for, I don't know, 30 years. Michael Cimbello was on guitar, who was playing with Wonder Love, Stevie Wonder's band at the time. And uh, Carlos Alomar who was playing with David Bowie. So this is my first session. So I'm like, you know, this is like, wow, I'm at Electric Lake, this is, a, this is what I want to do, you know. My second session was at uh, the Hit Factory, uh, which was unbelievable for me to have my second session be at the, the famous Hit Factory in New York. And that session, uh, Leon Pendarvis was on keyboards, Anthony Jackson, was on bass, and I believe Jeff Marinoff was on guitar, and that was uh, David. Maybe David Spinoza may have been on that as well. I'm not really sure. So that was my second session. So right then I knew, you know, I just knew what I wanted to do. So and so these, that was the caliber of musicianship that I was surrounded with at a very young age. And uh, uh, besides, like the bands I grew up with playing in the Bronx and so on and so forth, you know, that when I started doing sessions, I was like, wow, this is incredible. And I learned a lot every day, every measure of music I played, I was learning, you know, because I was, um, you know, the A-team guys were like Steve Gadd and Rick Morata, Chris Parker, Bernard Purdy, you name it. I mean, all the, I'm missing, you know, I'm not, naming a million other players, you know, but the, it was incredible the amount of musicianship in New York. So to just to get my foot in was a, a miracle in itself. And, and when I saw, you know, so I was playing with all these people and then uh, I did a record that there was a lot of time taken uh, doing these rhythm tracks. I'll never forget this. It was a, uh, a record that I was uh, recording out in Jersey, my favorite studio at the time was the House of Music in West Orange, New Jersey, and uh, late Charlie Conrad owned and ran that studio, and he taught me a lot about engineering. And um, so we were working on this record as a, you know, a lot of hard work going into these tracks. It was a really big deal. And then when the record came out, it didn't sound <clears throat> as good as I thought it should sound. You know, and I thought, you know, I could do that. You know, <laughs> so I said, you know, I said, well, this, you know, I really, you know, in my ear, the production of this should have it should have come out differently. So, and I was really into the record making process. So I I always watched this when I started doing television. It was the same thing. I started looking at what everybody was doing, and how they were doing it, and who the best. Uh, uh, people were doing it and and what their secrets were and I would pick people's brains. I didn't have any problem asking a lot of questions. It probably was pretty much uh, a, a little pest actually but I learned a lot and and I thought you know I could do that and I really loved the process. I love everything about recording you know so that's really how I got into it. I One of my favorite things is the creating of a track to, I love it. This is a creative field, you know, where you start out with sometimes nothing, or sometimes just the bare bones of a song, and then you, over time, it blossoms into this thing, and hopefully it blossoms into something really good, and then, and that's a wonderful thing to be at the end of the process and hear it come out the way you'd like it to come out, because he has a side person. You can plan a lot of people's 
uh, recordings and stuff, you don't get to, uh, you don't have a say on how the thing comes out. So you may have aspirations of or ideas about what it could have sounded like and stuff, but it doesn't mean that it's going to come out that way. I don't let some kind of technical thing stop when the when the when the creative energy is is, is flowing. It's uh, your job to capture that as a producer. You're supposed to capture that energy, and then you if you have to fix it later, whatever kind of thing, then you you do that later. But if you don't have a performance, you don't have anything. To, you know, so it doesn't really matter. I remember doing a session one time in the '80s uh, on a very a huge artist. Uh, I mean, the, the at the top of the the world at that time, and we were cutting the track and and um, and uh, a piece of outboard gear broke down, and it stopped the session. And I could not believe that the session was brought to a halt because of this one piece of outboard gear breaking down on the time and I just I could not believe what I, I was seeing and witnessing and the amount of money that was being spent and all of a sudden we're not recording because there's one you know reverb plate shut down you know I could just couldn't believe it so that was that wasn't a, I learned something on that session and I because I, I looked at all the musicians who were you know mostly upset and kind of befuddled by the whole thing and then looking at as a producer waste I mean that's money you're paying for it. now you're not doing it. I mean come on and then the thing is we were right there you know we we're right on the verge of getting the take and then we're not gonna do it because of reverb it's not where I mean what is happening you know so that was a something that I never forgot you have to have you know, a real, a good take on the pulse of, of the recording industry and what people like in a studio. For instance, I know people like coming here because it sounds so good. You want to be able to hear something that have sound really good. So that's a, a positive thing uh, of the many positive things in this place. Um, they're not going to go to a place that, you know, you can do that at home. If you want something to sound terrible, you know, <laughs> you can do that anywhere. You know, so um, people are going to have to come in with new ideas. You know, the duality with this, with all this great channel, uh, these great channel strips and stuff, that's a great idea. Having an incredible monitoring system, that's a, it's, it's essential. Having a great environment, great lighting, great aesthetics, immaculate bathrooms, key to the recording. If you're going to go out of your house to record, or else you can stay home and record. I've known Troy for a very long time. I knew his father very well. And uh, so the, the recording aspect is in the blood. So when Troy builds a studio he's thinking of a lot of different things not only the sonics but the aesthetics and everything that goes into the recording environment is extremely important uh, so when I came here the first time to listen and I think uh, Russ Teitelman had the same experience I had because I talked to him about it afterwards we listened to this playback system and it was the best monitoring monitoring system we had ever heard in a studio. And we were just overwhelmed. And we started putting on everything that we had ever worked on and started feeling good about ourselves. You know, it was like, yeah, all right, I'm not so bad after all. This is not bad. This sounds really good. And I could have done that for hours and days. And this is like a little kind of playground, you know, because it sounds so good in both rooms, the playback system, that... You know, wow, it's like, okay, so this is the way it sounds. So, like, if it doesn't sound good, then your stuff doesn't sound good. 